beginning with this year's elections, voting gets a whole lot easier. Your mailbox is your ballot box. Your ballot packet comes to you in the mail. But only if you're a registered voter. If you need to register or update your address, do it today at elections.hawaii.gov. Look for your free Hawaii elections guide in the newspaper or at these locations statewide. The deadline to register for the general election is October 5th, so don't delay. Hawaii, Hawaii votes by mail. Well, how's it going, everyone? Thanks so much for tuning in to Spotlight Hawaii as we begin yet another week together. Of course, I'm Ryan Kalei Suji, joined by Yanji Denise, and this is Spotlight Hawaii brought to you by the Office of Election, which reminds you that general election is coming up and there is still time to register. For those of you who have not yet registered for the election, October 5th is that deadline. And uh, we will actually be diving in to speaking to some of the candidates that will be running for some of these offices later this week. But first off, Yanji, well, we have two very special guests joining us today. Yeah, we're so fortunate for this whole month. Governor David Ige has agreed to join us every Monday because things are changing so rapidly. We want to go straight to the top every Monday, start our week off with a lot of information. So we're so happy to welcome him on. And then after uh, he's finished speaking with us this morning, we're going to be joined by Denise Iseri Matsubara. Now she is heading up the state's rental relief program. That's the housing assistance program that they've announced recently. That's up to $2,000 a month in rental relief uh, on Oahu and $1,500 a month for rental relief on the neighbor islands. So she's going to walk us through what you have to do to apply and take your questions live. This is really important. So um, you have a little bit of time before she comes on because we are going to be speaking to the governor first. So if you or someone you know has questions about the program, Please let them know that this is happening. Of course, in the meantime, our headliner, if you will, Governor David Ige joining us. <laughs> Happy Monday to you, Governor. Uh, let's get the latest from you. How are we looking as a state right now? Yeah, well, thanks, uh, Yunji and Ryan. I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, I do want to thank uh, all the people of Hawaii for really paying attention to the new stay-at-home order here on uh, in the county of uh, Oahu. Uh, we uh, are seeing uh, an encouraging tr trend as the number of cases have um, fallen um, over the last uh, five, six, seven days. So uh, clearly uh, everyone is making the sacrifice that is so necessary for us to be successful. Um, so, uh, you know, we will continue uh, as uh, all of you are aware. Um, Mayor Caldwell had extended the order another uh, two weeks because we, we did not see uh, in the first week uh, the kind of reduction that we wanted to see. And we are actually now seeing the case counts reduce. Uh, I'm, I'm glad. And that's in spite of uh, us doing the search testing uh, and testing a lot more people than uh, we normally do, uh, we still see the case counts being uh, reduced. You know, we want to talk a little bit about uh, just the businesses that are struggling. Obviously, there's a lot of pushback that came about when uh, the mayor announced this extension of the two weeks and, and those businesses saying uh, some that they will be closing for good. Uh, what is your response to, I guess, some of those who are saying they need things to open up right away uh, could we be looking at a longer extension, uh, longer than these additional two weeks? And, and how uh, are, is the state maybe helping to support some of these businesses? You know, we uh, are doing a couple of things. Uh, as you know, um, uh, just the rental relief program, uh, we believe, is uh, important uh, on the residential side. Uh, one of the things, and, and Denise, I'm glad you guys are having Denise on because she'll talk about it more specifically. But uh, you know, the assistance will be going directly to the landlord so that we can make certain that uh, the funds are being provided. Uh, you know, we are working with the counties on business relief programs. You know, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We have been talking with uh, all of the program managers on the business relief side, uh, finding out um, whether they're oversubscribed. You know, they've um, all, all of the counties have announced business support programs. Uh, we're talking with them. If they run through all the funds that we've made available to them, uh, we uh, definitely have additional funds that we can provide to them so that they can provide additional uh, relief for businesses. Uh, so this is an all of government uh, response, federal, county, and state agencies uh, collaborating together, uh, really trying to um, uh, rely on the strength of each organization in the best way possible. 
Uh, we want to bring in the audience at 10.33, Ryan, uh, Anne-Marie Madero says, what is he actively doing about the veterans' home in Hilo? Not what he's planning or looking at, but actions being taken. Too many are sick and have passed. There has been uh, a lot of scrutiny. Mayor Harry Kim holding a press conference over the weekend, calling for some big changes over there. What are we expecting to see? Um, you know, we've already lost so many and, and also so many uh, cases of COVID, not necessarily fatal, but just so many sick as well. Yes, we did uh, do a couple of things. Uh, we had uh, uh, a team uh, go in to audit the um, activities of the Veterans Home. Um, the state regulators uh, were there last week um, with a team uh, inspecting the home and making sure that all of the CDC guidelines um, are, are implemented in a way that makes sense. Uh, we also sent um, uh, and participated with, as you know, uh, Senator Schatz had uh, requested that the Veterans Administration uh, get involved. And uh, so there was a team uh, made up of um, federal and state um, experts uh, that went over there to uh, interview the staff and find out um, the, the actions taken. Uh, and um, making recommendations about what we can do to uh, ensure that um, the virus stops spreading in that home and that we can uh, see better outcomes moving forward. You know, over the weekend, of course, it was announced that new Lieutenant Governor Josh Green, uh, in fact, tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, have you been in a conversation with him? And uh, what is sort of his role now that he's sort of in this isolation, uh, working from home? And uh, we know that he had his hand in many areas in, in terms of the response, but uh, how is that going to be facilitated now that he's sort of in this 14-day quarantine period? You know, we uh, have, uh, Ryan, as part of what everybody and every organization is doing, we have gone to implementing a lot of the physical distancing and um, best practices about how to live with COVID. Uh, so most of our meetings have already been virtual. We've been uh, video conferencing. Uh, many of the meetings uh, that we have to talk about the policies going forward. So uh, I, I, my understanding is that, um, that um, the Lieutenant Governor's uh, COVID uh, experience so far has, has really been mild. And, um, you know, he said that he would be uh, able to participate in the way that he has for the last uh, month or so. Uh, most of our meetings are virtual. Uh, the only time that he's really come into uh, the governor's office is when uh, we're doing press conferences and those kinds of things. And as you know, we've uh, migrated even those uh, interactions to have more people presenting uh, via Zoom or Teams or other uh, video conferencing me mechanisms so that we can reduce the face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, Jane LaForce asks at 1038, what is your plan to reopen tourism? I, I think that a lot of people are still going back to the business question that Ryan posed earlier. Um, you know, the Kama'aina economy can only do so much, even if the lockdowns are lifted at the end of the month. Are we still looking at an October 1st uh, time frame for opening Trans-Pacific travel in some way uh, with testing and the things that we've discussed in the past? You know, we I did uh, meet with a number of uh, industry um, leaders uh, over the weekend, and we talked about what would be um, required to uh, bring back visitors. and And it's really two different uh, part, uh, parts of it. You know, first uh, is as we had announced, kind of a pre-travel testing program. Uh, we uh, have moved forward in the most important components. We have a digital platform. Uh, you know, all of the, those coming into the state right now, subject to quarantine, are filling in the forms, uh, doing the health surveys as necessary uh, so that we can manage the uh, quarantines. Uh, you know, that platform was fundamentally important as we look at um, bringing back uh, visitors. Uh, just in speaking with uh, many of the, the hotels and the industry um, leaders, you know, they they have said uh, from the beginning that they really need about a month's uh, lead time in order to uh, bring staff back on board to begin training, all the activities that would be required to um, allow us to bring visitors. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're starting to look at it uh, kind of in uh, two uh, different ways. 
you know, pre-travel testing and having people uh, get a test prior to actually coming to the islands really helps us uh, as a community because we will know that uh, they uh, were tested and are negative prior to coming here. Uh, and then, you know, when would Hawaii be ready to accept uh, travelers, you know, when are restaurants going to be opened? Uh, when are we going to have the kind of experience that um, people expect when they travel to Hawaii? Uh, that's uh, what we're working with the industry on, making sure that they can gear up uh, as appropriate. Uh, so, you know, that that might end up um, being a, a separate dates maybe that we would be looking at, you know, beginning uh, to allow us to uh, implement uh, pre-travel testing so that people can test prior to getting and traveling to the islands. Uh, and then really working with the industry in a way to uh, bring back uh, visitors in a real way. So is October 1st still the goal or are we looking at, I know you said there's sort of two tracks, but yes. are, are we still pushing for that or, no, or is that I, later? Yes, uh, definitely. Just talking with um, uh, many in the industry, it will probably not be October 1st, but uh, in the next few days we'll be uh, providing a better plan for the scheduling of what those dates would look like. You know, we want to uh, thank everybody for these comments. There's, again, a lot of comments coming in, and, and we're going to try to get to as many as we can. Uh, but maybe to sort of summarize some of the comments that are coming in, uh, again, uh, some of the concerns are always about unemployment uh, and, and some of the backlogs that continue to happen. There are people saying that they've been waiting up to six months, others saying uh, that they're running out of options, that the rental program does help, but that they still need money uh, for things like food and such. So. Uh, what is sort of an update on on that procedure? Uh, you know, is there anything additional that has happened in the past few months? We know that they're continuing to work through that backlog, but what what is an update from what's happening with the UI office? Yeah, we are are definitely. Uh, I just got a brief an update um, uh, last Friday, and again uh, this morning uh, before getting on. Uh, so. Uh, we have uh, identified uh, those and separated um, uh, those that are real um, people with real claims and uh, we'll be going through uh, those at least on the poor side um, you know and and being able to process um, more of those um, claims uh, over the next week so I think uh, for those on uh, PUA that have been um, recognized as a valid claim uh, we'll be getting uh, to many of them um, this week. Uh, on the UI side, uh, the, the claims that are in the system now are really uh, those that uh, have, have to be adjudicated. You know, there is a difference. You know, the claimant uh, said that they were uh, let go because of uh, COVID, uh, and the employer is saying that, uh, no, uh, they were... Um, terminated for cause. Uh, and so those cases now have to be adjudicated. Uh, Anne started a program where she has a number of lawyers who have agreed to get trained uh, in uh, helping to adjudicate uh, those cases. Uh, we are getting uh, a number of volunteers uh, who are showing up in the office every single day to help adjudicate those cases, You know, talk to uh, both employers as well as the employees. Uh, and make decisions about um, whether they're entitled to or not entitled to benefits. Uh, so we we uh, hope to be able to move through a lot more claims on on both the UI side and the PUA side. Uh, kind of a bit of good news, you know, we did uh, open uh, the th new three hundred dollar um, claims uh, for those uh, over the weekend for the first time, uh, and we uh, had. Um, 100,000 applicants um, get through. We processed uh, more of the initial claims uh, for that program uh, uh, over the last few days than we ever have under both the, the UI and the um, uh, and the PUA program. So at least um, the, the computer systems are working better uh, and will be in a better place to uh, validate and pay out uh, those new claims for the $300 uh, program and I mean I think you saw some of the news announcements. You know we've paid out more than three billion dollars since March first in both UI claims as well as uh, pool claims. And uh, with this additional um, this new program that it was initiated by 
uh, the president, you know, we hope to be able to begin uh, playing uh, claims out in, uh, in about two weeks. Wow, $3 billion is a pretty staggering number Great when you number. put it like that. Um, sure. let's, let's bring in Robert, R Robert's question, uh, Ryan, this one, 1043, I'm calling out the stamp timestamps because there are just so many questions coming in, but it says, sir, would you change the current Honolulu? Um, he's, he's talking about the, the order for the solos, uh, people being just by themselves, especially with individual activities. Would you change it to individual households? Uh, when Dr. Green was on this program last week, he said that he had sent a memo to the to the city, and and I think he cc'd the state on that, um, basically saying that the so the solo restriction was too restrictive. Uh, what's your view on that? Do you agree that it should be households? This is especially pertinent to people with young children who obviously can't send their kids to the beach or the park by themselves. You know, we definitely are looking at those uh, challenges, Yanji, and. You know, I, I think as we were looking at and, um, you know, we had met with the mayor's team going through that extension and what would be appropriate and what would not. Um, as you recall, the first two weeks of the stay at home order, um, we, although the, the number of cases had flattened, we did not see a reduction in the number of new cases that we were seeing. Uh, and so, you know, it is a, a complex kind of decision that we're making. And uh, we, the mayor really felt that there needed to be a bright line um, that they could enforce uh, on, on beaches, uh, parks, and trails, uh, and uh, decided that it should be uh, individuals. Uh, we have been talking about going forward and uh, beyond this uh, two-week uh, stay-at-home that we're in, uh, and about the notion that uh, of the family unit, about uh, being able to uh, include uh, those kinds of uh, units as uh, as an ongoing activity because clearly we want people to be able to exercise uh, in a way that's safe. Uh, and so certainly um, uh, we hope that those changes would be in the next order as we move forward. So, but do you support keeping them in place through September 24th as it is now? Yes, I do. I do uh, support uh, what the mayor has done. You know, again, it's it's about uh, trying to look at um, uh, and making sure that um, that people take personal responsibility. You know, I've so I've had to change where I exercise. I end up running around the, the state capitol by myself uh, over the last two weeks, and I I do think that um, it is about changing our behavior in a way that helps us fight the virus and. Uh, you know, part of these are for short durations um, so that we can reduce the, the number of new cases that we're seeing. You know, another question, uh, a headline over the past few weeks has just sort of been the changes that are happening in the Department of Health. Uh, can you sort of give us an update on some of those changes that are happening? Are you confident with the team moving forward, knowing that they are essentially new people now involved in, in leading this department? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I look forward to, as you know, uh, Elizabeth Char or Libby Char will be coming on as the director on Wednesday. Uh, we, I've had uh, many conversations with her um, virtually daily uh, talking about transition issues. Uh, we uh, had planned uh, some of the restructuring in the Department of Health uh, before uh, Libby was um, selected as the uh, the director of the Department of Health, um, really trying to align the resources necessary so that um, the department can respond to the public health emergency that we're seeing. Uh, so she uh, definitely will be involved as we fine tune the changes. Uh, she uh, has ideas about additional resources because we are uh, hiring additional staff uh, to ensure that we can protect the public's uh, health and well being. Uh, and she, uh, you know, she's an emergency room physician. She has long time relationships with many in the public health arena. Uh, and she certainly has um, brought a, a wealth of um, people and resources that, uh, and I think uh, energy uh, to the challenge and uh, certainly looking forward to her coming on board. 
How is contact tracing going? Do you feel like that we have enough people on board that that's been so much of the scrutiny that's fallen on, on the department is the lack of contact tracing and perhaps um, not enough transparency around that program? Are you confident that we have uh, the ability to contact trace in the way that we need right now? Uh, yes, I do. And we are committed to expanding that uh, further. Uh, as you are aware, we set up um, the uh, Hawaii Convention Center uh, as a training and a facility that we can call from. Uh, and we are continuing to uh, increase the number of people that we uh, have on staff. Uh, you know, Libby has uh, some uh, great ideas. And I think you've seen uh, Emily Roberson, who uh, is uh, leading that effort. Um, also talking at uh, increased partnerships about how we can include um, uh, community health centers uh, and others in uh, the responsibility of contact tracing. So, you know, I'm, I, I do believe that our, our game plan and the framework moving forward uh, will expand the number of contact tracers. Uh, and I, you know, look forward to being able to better serve the community uh, so that we can get to all of those who are COVID positive uh, and identify any close contacts so that we can help them isolate and stop infecting others. You know, we're going to be talking with uh, Denise Sarimasubara in just a, a few moments here. But uh, before we get to that, uh, we know that there's the rental relief program, but there are many people who are calling for the same sort of support for small businesses. Again, we are seeing these comments coming in. Is there any way that the state could potentially provide the same sort of rental relief uh, for retail merchants and, and those who have to pay rent uh, as part of their uh, lease agreements to operate these small businesses, because many of these small businesses are saying uh, they're struggling, they need cash, they need to be able to pay rent. Could the same type of program that's essentially set up for the rental be transferred over to those in the business community? Yeah, you know, Ryan, we are uh, talking with the business community and trying to figure out um, what kind of support is needed you know, as I said, we don't want to recreate and duplicate programs that the county has already set up. And we're really working uh, with the counties to uh, see what has worked and what hasn't worked. And then talking with the business community about uh, in which areas uh, we would need to uh, make changes or what kinds of support uh, are not being provided by the county. So um, you know, as I said, we're going to uh, support the counties. If they need additional monies, uh, we would uh, make work to make it available to them. Uh, and then, uh, you know, if there are other areas that are not being addressed, then certainly we would be looking to plug those gaps. Last time that we went through a lockdown, uh, there was a lot of criticism in hindsight that we perhaps opened up a little bit too quickly. So we're, you know, we're all anticipating what's going to happen uh, toward the end of the month. I believe the date is September 24th when the mayor's order will expire. Um, what kind of a reopening are we anticipating? I, I'd, I'd imagine that we're not going from zero to 60. What do you think will still, I mean, what, you know, as people sort of try to mentally and also business wise anticipate what's coming, uh, what what is that going to look like? Do you think? You know, Yanji, we've uh, spent um, almost daily conversations with the city and county of Honolulu to really talk about and think about what that uh, reopening plan should look like. Uh, we've both been looking at the California plan and where they have uh, specific metrics identified for the number of new cases that would be allowable. Uh, and what would trigger uh, reopening additional businesses or if the cases increase again, um, and moving back and, and closing things. So, uh, you know, we are uh, working to that and intend to kind of uh, announce the framework and what those guidelines would be uh, that make sense so that everybody could see what they are. I know that uh, many have asked that we publish those kinds of metrics on a regular basis. You know, we are committed uh, trying to make sure that we capture the data and can publish it on a on a regular basis uh, and uh, setting up the metrics uh, and the program so that people could clearly see what would happen with uh, restaurants and gyms and, you know, all the other kinds of activities, uh, depending on the number of cases that they see. Uh, we do hope that the uh, plan that we would be able to announce would have all of those elements so that people can follow along uh, based on the case counts that they see. 
Okay, uh, you know, we have to move on here and, and get to Denise here, who's waiting and standing by to talk more about the rent relief program, but just wanted to allow you one, maybe last opportunity to uh, sort of just have a, a closing statement. You know, obviously there's a lot of comments going on right now. A lot of people just frustrated, a lot of these businesses suffering, a lot of people talking just about uh, how they are really suffering in this second shutdown. Uh, what would be your final message to those who are frustrated with our current state and where we're at right now? You know, clearly um, the mayor and I did not want to do this second shutdown. We were working, uh, trying to implement those programs and restrictions that uh, made the most sense. But as the number of cases continued to increase and we got, you know, above 100, then above 200, and then above 300 on a couple of days, clearly the message wasn't getting out. Um, fighting COVID-19 is about an all of community effort and and each and every one of us have to take personal responsibility about the, the actions that we need to take. Stay home when you're sick. Keep your children home when you're sick. Wash your hands. Use hand sanitizer. All of those have to become part of our daily activity. You know, Ryan, it's, it's, it's sort of like, and, and, and public health people have made the, the correlation to seatbelts. You know, seatbelts were available in cars for like 50 years and nobody used them. In fact, everybody took pains about how to remove them or make sure that it didn't get in people's way until we made the connection that uh, seatbelts uh, save lives because, um, you know, if you didn't have them on, then people died in auto accidents. You know, everyone in our community needs to understand that we have to learn to live with COVID. That means every business, every organization has to uh, not encourage uh, lunchroom um, conversations because you can't eat lunch and have a mask on and protect yourself and other employees. You know, we are seeing that it's those fundamental social interactions in an unstructured way that is spreading the virus. And we all need to do everything we can to stop those activities from happening. So just thank you for giving me this opportunity. I know you guys will be very excited with Denise and I, I wanted to personally thank the legislature uh, for their support in, um, in authorizing us the rental relief program. And you know, Denise uh, has been working very hard, Ryan, as you said, to really expand to other areas, mortgage support and other things. She won't be talking about commercial and business activity, uh, that really is a separate program, um, but we are working with the counties to see how we can help in that area as well. Well, wonderful to have you on. Thank you so much, Governor. And I know there are a lot of business owners who we see them all in the comments who are very much uh, eager to, to get any uh, relief on that, on that front. So thank you so much. And we will see you in a week. We'll see you next Monday. Yep, thank Hello. you. Okay, right. Ryan, well, we've got a lot to talk about there, but let's get right to our next guest because we're already seeing plenty of comments. Um, Denise, thank you so much for being here. She, of course, is here to talk about the state's rental relief and housing assistance program. Um, so please, uh, let's have productive comments. We wanna get to stuff that, um, you know, people are just starting to navigate this. So let's start with the basics, who qualifies? Sure, thank you so much, uh, Yunji, and thank you, Ryan. So if you're unemployed or partially unemployed due to the pandemic and your household income is at or below 100% of the area median income, that translates to about $88,000 if you're single or a little under $126,000 for a family of four on Oahu. All you need is a lease agreement, be a Hawaii resident 18 years or older, then you may qualify for financial assistance under this program. You know, I want to make very clear, it's not a grant or a loan. It's a payment to help those at risk of eviction through no fault of their own. So the state really would like to help um, using the first tranche of the CARES funds, and that'll be $50 million, uh, which is going to be focused on rent relief. Rent payments up to $2,000 per month on Oahu and $1,500 per month on the neighbor islands are available. And they'll be made directly to the landlords through our nonprofit partners. The good thing is um, uh, it can be made in lump sum amounts for up to three months at a time. Um, and it's being administered by Catholic Charities Hawaii and the Aloha United Way. For more information, I really encourage folks to visit our new website at hihousinghelp.com. 
you know, we have, um, so if you can sort of talk through the process, we have a question here from Kelly, who's saying that she applied, but has not heard back um, about her application and paperwork will receive. Um, when will she hear back if she's approved or not? What does that process look like once they've submitted their application? Who and when should they be expecting uh, those sort of confirmation and information? So first of all, because there are multiple programs going on, the city also has their hardship relief program. The state has now this rent relief program. We want to be sure that folks are applying to the right program. This state program just launched last week, Tuesday. So um, it's going to take a couple weeks to process. Uh, luckily, Catholic Charities Hawaii had begun to accept applications manually before the launch and was actually able to process some payments during the first week of the launch. So if you tendered a complete and correct uh, application, it'll take a couple of weeks. Again, if you're looking and applying through the state uh, program, that's a state program, I can't speak for the city program, and I think there's there may be some confusion going on. The counties as well uh, have similar uh, programs going as well. Loke has a question here. What about our mortgage payments? Is this simply for people who are renters, or does this apply for mortgage holders as well? Thank you, Yunji. That's a really good question because this is phase one of the program. We hope to cover mortgage uh, payments as well as back uh, rent payments and back mortgage payments all the way up to the beginning of the CARES period, which is March 1st, through phase two of the program, which we hope to launch before the end of the month. So that would be uh, for, for so people would then just provide documentation that they had some sort of hindrance uh, and that they will be allowed to get uh, compensated back for some of the earlier months of, of the pandemic. Is that correct? So among the, the documents that are required are the picture ID, your social security card, for rent, it's a lease agreement, for the mortgage, it's gotta be some kind of a delinquent, delinquency notice from the lender. So there's gotta be some kind of proof um, that you're in the predicament that you're in due to COVID. Okay, Dave Jimmy says, and, and people have all different kinds of um, you know housing situations. He says, I pay my rent to my roommate. Can I apply? How does that work if you're in a roommate situation? We know that so many people live together. Sure. So what is required at this point, and the payment is made to the landlord, uh, and you need to have a current and valid lease agreement. So as long as you have a valid lease agreement, it's current and the payment will be made to the landlord. Right. So I guess in that situation, it would be the roommate would essentially have to be the Whoever's landlord. Whoever's on the lease, right? Right. It would have to be the right. person getting in. Uh, what has been the response so far? I mean, we know that this program just launched on Tuesday. Um, has there been, uh, what are some of the numbers that you're seeing in terms of the people that are applying for this? So the, the response has been pretty good. The phones, from what I understand, um, have been ringing off the hook. Hundreds of calls to 521 Help and 211. Um, the new website has had over 80,000 hits. It was just launched on Tuesday. They received combined between Catholic Charities and Aloha United Way over 6,000 applications. Um, I, I was looking back at some of the city and county records, what they had shared with me, and this is kind of where they were in terms of applications received, you know, I think three months into the program. So it, it's, uh, it's got some good response, um, but the best news of all is that we were able to actually process some, some applications and get some checks out during the first week of the launch through uh, Catholic Charities. So this is for uh, what people are asking about what, what months this qualifies for. This is for August through the end of the year, is that correct? That's correct. This first phase is from August through December, and then phase two, once it's launched, will cover all the way from the beginning of the CARES period, which is March 1 through December. Got it. And again, to clarify, uh, people are saying, do we need to pay this back uh, in, in terms of these rent payment? And your answer is no, they don't, correct? If they qualify. It's not a loan. It's not a grant. It's a payment. This is the state's form of help. Got it. Okay. 
Um, and then a lot of people asking about the business side. Now we, we talked about that in, in our conversation with the governor at some point, this, this, that could be a program, but this is specifically for housing. This is specifically for res residential housing. Correct. Okay. Uh, you know, before we, we head out, what would sort of your advice be, I guess, to those who uh, are considering applying for this, uh, program. Uh, again, you can maybe, if you can repeat the website for us again, so we can make sure that people get that. Uh, but just sort of what they're looking at in, in sort of from the application process to the time that it is actually approved. I mean, what is this sort of length of time and, and just any other tips you can provide that will help people through this process? Sure. Thanks, Ryan. So first of all, visit the website. It's hihousinghelp.com. The phone banks do tend to get overwhelmed. So that's your uh, quickest way to get help is going to hihousinghelp.com. Um, if you fill out the application correctly, completely, and you have the supporting documents, which aren't many readily available, you can probably get your application processed within a couple of weeks and then get a check uh, paid to the landlord the week after. Okay, and then and, um, Monroe Murdoch wants to know, and we, and I know you said CARES money, but just so the people are clear on this, he wants to know who pays for this taxpayer dollars at work? How much debt will Hawaii incur through the pandemic at what cost to the taxpayers? So where is this money? Where's that $50 million coming from? So the $50 million uh, was appropriated in Act 9, which is funded through the CARES funding, federal CARES funding. Right. And, and I guess if someone is approved, I guess that's just the conversation that they're going to have to have with their landlord, essentially, that they will, uh, I'm assuming, receive some sort of notification that they did, in fact, qualify, that payment will be made to the landlord, uh, and then that they would just need to follow up directly with their landlord to ensure that payment was received. It, it was, is that sort of the gist of how that's going to work? Absolutely. So the tenant would have to apply, and then the landlord would have to sign a form that certifies that they receive the payment. And once they cash a check, actually that certification that they receive the payment and they may not evict their tenants. Okay, and, and also just to be clear, does the, does the landlord need to do anything in this process? Well, they, they're just gonna have to verify uh, okay. with the nonprofits, yes. But in terms of the application or whatever, they, they don't need to do anything all the, on the front end. All the application uh, has to come from the tenant. Got it. Okay. Well, thank you, Denise. Uh, this has certainly been insightful and uh, we look forward to potentially having you back on if there is uh, more information about phase two uh, in terms of mortgage payments and, and some of the other things that you had discussed. Uh, we'd, be, uh, we'd love to have you back on to kind of get an update on that as well when that is appropriate. Thank you very much. Love to join you folks. All right, thank you. <laughs> Take care. Again, that website is hihousinghelp.com. Um, as she mentioned, this is all being administered through Catholic Charities and Aloha United Way. Uh, those phone lines, as she said, do tend to get tied up. So best to head to the website first, start the process there. And then if you need additional assistance, call the phone lines. But we don't want you stuck on hold forever and ever because we know how frustrating that can be. But, uh, you know, very needed program for so many, up to $2,000 a month on Oahu, $1,500 a month for neighbor islands. Um, depending on how much assistance you qualify for. First phase, August through December, and then second phase, we'll be doing back payments all the way from when the pandemic began back in March. Yeah, that's going to be critical because we know that so many people have uh, been struggling for some time now, especially with the backlog from the unemployment office and uh, those not only tenants, but landlords that could essentially, that are essentially uh, unable to get payments from renters and are still having to get mortgage payments or having to ask for delay payments on mortgage payments. It's sort of just as a tr trickle down effect that is impacting everyone. So uh, great to hear that that is potentially in the works as well. And again, we will bring uh, Denise back on it, when that uh, second phase rolls out to provide more information for those uh, who are looking for that back payment and mortgage. But again, going back to the governor's uh, comments and uh, our interview with him earlier, bringing up some issues and some things and, and some, I guess, breaking news, so to speak, when he's saying realistically, October 1st, not looking like a reality for opening of Trans-Pacific traffic to Hawaii. Yeah, he said that he'd announce when the time frame will actually be probably in the next few days, but it doesn't sound like that's going to happen on October 1st. He also said that he, you know, essentially disagrees with uh, Lieutenant Governor Josh Green. He supports the mayor's solo enforcement 
for uh, recreational and outdoor activities, and he does not plan to uh, try to push for any change in that regard. Um, so that is something where he and the lieutenant governor differ, and it looks like for now that is going to be staying in place unless we hear otherwise from the mayor. Um, we know a lot of you are frustrated with that, especially those folks with small children. Um, and then he also said that when it comes to reopening uh, on September 24th, they're looking at California as a model. Uh, California has a system where if they reach above a certain positivity threshold, different enforcement actions take place. Uh, and we could be seeing something like that as well. They're still drilling down on the details on what that would look like here in Hawaii. Yeah, but a big you know conversation I guess he had over the weekend is with some of those hospitality partners and those in the tourism industry saying, uh, that they're going to probably need a month notice and at this point in time obviously uh, it being september 14th that the october 1st that dead, uh deadline is uh looking like it will be pushed back just because they simply do not know uh with our case numbers and with this current extension that we find ourselves in if the state will indeed uh be back up and running which includes the opening of other establishments as well uh he's saying that it's going to be sort of a phased approach that things will sort of tear open rather than sort of opening up uh, Hawaii to tourists as well as all the businesses that are currently in this shutdown mode. So we'll continue to wait and get updates on that uh, as it sort of happens. We'll be speaking again with him on Monday to get more information. And uh, that will kind of be the last week, I believe. It'll be, so we're in, we'll be entering the last week at that point of this current stay-at-home order for the island of Oahu. Yeah, and we are going to be pivoting to politics for the rest of the week. Uh, we have shows, of course, coming up on Wednesday and Friday. This Wednesday, we're going to have the two candidates vying for the Honolulu Prosecutor's Office. That's uh, Judge Stephen Alm and Megan Cow. They're going to be talking to us. You know, both of them have worked in the prosecutor's office in the past, uh, but they have different philosophies on how the office should be run. That office, of course, um, you know, so much scandal and controversy surrounding it with um, the Kealohas and, and everything that has happened as a result of that case. So a lot of people calling for some major changes. What will that look like? We're gonna sit down with them or virtually sit down with them, if you will. And we've invited both of them on. This is a discussion where they can ask each other questions and you can ask them questions. We're looking forward to that. And then uh, Ryan, we have another de a debate or discussion, if you will, on Friday. That's right, we're gonna be focusing in on Hawaii Island. Uh, for the first time in 12 years, there will be a new mayor in that role uh, with the two contenders going at it, uh, Mitch Roth against Ikaika Marzo. Both of them will also be joining us to talk about some of the issues happening on Hawaii Island and some of the things that they hope to do, especially with this uh, pandemic as well. Uh, a change in leadership, obviously, during this time is going to be critically important to sort of figure out what their plans may be moving forward as we enter into a, hopefully another, you know, a new phase of COVID-19, but still uh, how they would handle the pandemic moving forward for Hawaii Island. So we look forward to that conversation again on Friday. Until Wednesday, of course, we wish you a fond aloha. Please take care of yourself. As the governor said, wash your hands, mask up, socially distance, and we will see you right back here, 1030 on Wednesday. Aloha.